we will uh, do, do the same format as usual. Let's begin with the prayer and asking for God's presence with us and his inspiration. And as usual, uh, Praveen will lead us in the opening prayer. Right. Go ahead, Praveen. Father, we are in your presence, thanking you for giving us another opportunity, Lord, that we could come together and to study your word. Especially, Lord, this moment, uh, as we're going to study uh, from your scripture, Lord, I pray that your grace may be granted to us so that our hearts and minds may be open and receptive towards the Spirit's revelation, O oh God. We want to hear your voice through Pastor Dan as he teaches. Um, Lord, I pray uh, the time we spend in discussion may be beneficial to uh, everyone who participates, Lord. We may have good, meaningful, encouraging, and edifying discussions, which may be acceptable in your sight. Lead us and guide us through everything we do. We, your name be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, and thank you all for joining. Good evening, and uh, to all of you in India. Good morning to Anil and Rekha. Uh, pleasure to have Franklin and uh, Veronica join us. Uh, and of course, uh, all the other regulars. Uh, today's study, once again, will be a one-off. And then uh, this was prompted by a question that uh, Mr. Rao was struggling with. And so I decided that we will uh, uh, take up this particular issue of the Tower of Babel, uh, which is uh, narrated for us in Genesis chapter 11. So today's task and uh, the way I will deal with it is, first we will read the narrative in Genesis chapter 11 and uh, then look at some problems that uh, people raise uh, with regards to this particular story. Uh, a contradiction, its historicity. And then, of course, I think for us, I think even more important is what is probably the lesson or the theology behind the incident? Uh, what is it that we can learn from uh, this? What is God or what is God trying to help us recognize from this particular incident? Okay, so having said that, from time to time, I will share my screen. And so since we are going to read the narrative, so let me just uh, pull up that particular verse uh, or rather passage in the scriptures. Let's uh, sort of look at it together. Give me just a moment as I share my screen with you. Uh, all right, I hope uh, you can see the screen, I'm presuming, yes. So the narrative, uh, is in the book of Genesis chapter 11. And uh, let me just see, yes. Uh, we will go to Genesis chapter 11. I hope that uh, the screen is big enough for you to, to uh, read. But nevertheless, uh, I will read and then you can follow. Okay, beginning in verse one. Now, the whole, by the way, this is from the ESV. Uh, so I've taken the English Standard Version uh, uh, for this particular uh, passage. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar or Shinar and settled there. Verse three, and they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. Uh, one moment. I think I should go to the next one. Okay, verse 5. It says, um, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, 
so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from, from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because the, there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Okay, so that is the uh, narrative as uh, given in the book of Genesis chapter 11. Uh, reading this, some people find some problems with it. And they have even concluded that because of these so-called problems, apparent contradictions, the Bible is definitely not uh, reliable. They feel this is just a myth that the Bible has included and just borrowed from some other uh, texts. And so they proceed to disprove the, or rather the veracity of the scriptures. All right. Now, what is one of the problems that uh, people come up with? And that is the very existence of the tower. Uh, they would argue that archaeology has not discovered the remains of this tower, and hence maybe uh, they will cast doubts on the historicity of this particular uh, you know, story and, of course, the existence of the tower. Now, uh, the story actually begins in chapter 10. We have to go back a little bit. And uh, I don't think I have that on the screen. Let me just read you what it says in, in chapter 10, because it identifies someone that uh, is significant in this particular story. Uh, Genesis chapter 10 and beginning in verse 8, it says, Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Verse 10 in, in chapter 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erek, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So the Bible proceeds to say that Nimrod was the founder of this particular uh, city, right? And uh, in my little study, I, has been, I have been using uh, a historian and his uh, findings. His name is David Rohl, R-O-H-L. Uh, and I'm going to refer from what he has had to say with regards to the discoveries he has made. According to him, people in that particular time congregated you know, uh, together. And the first city state, you could say, or the first city civilization was in this land of China. And in China, the first city civilization of Mesopotamia, you know, Mesopotamia was the general area in which this particular land uh, existed. And according to the records we have, Mesopotamia is the oldest recorded civilization. Now it says that Nimrod, Got, you know, went ahead and built the city. And uh, uh, some people feel that God got very upset because God is against urbanization, right? Uh, some people feel that God does not like cities. <laughs> and so since Nimrod built a city, God was upset or angry with him. But of course, that I would believe is a stretch. It cannot necessarily be verified from scripture. Uh, the reason some say people are again, or rather God is against urbanization or the building of cities is because in Genesis chapter one and two, he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, he wanted people to migrate and uh, move around the earth rather than congregating in one specific location. And so they take that to prove that God was against urbanization. But I believe that there is God's uh, judgment against Babel was something else. And we will see that as we go along. 
Okay, so M, uh, uh, the question is, if people, uh, you know, doubt the historicity of the Tower of the ba or the Tower of Babel, then of course they have to doubt the existence of the city of ba uh, of, of Babylon. You could say at that particular point in time, uh, and the existence of a man called Nimrod. But in David Rawls, uh, you know, and his uh, uh, you know findings, his uh, research. Uh, the word, or rather the name Nimrod, could have been another name in the, probably the Mesopotamian Sumerian uh, culture. And he came across somebody called Enmekar. Uh, and Enmekar is a combination of two, Enmer and Kar, which means Enmer is Nimrod in the Sumerian language, and Kar is the hunter. So Enmer the hunter or Nimrod the hunter. And he found that such a person existed. Uh, and interestingly enough, this word Enmer also seemed to indicate, uh, or rather me the meaning could also have rebel in it or rebellion in it. Uh, so this man was, you know, the Bible says a mighty hunter, perhaps a reference to the fact that he was in one sense opposing God, you know, I mean, he could have been a hunter in the sense that he hunted animals, but on the other hand, it could have a broader meaning, which could uh, encompass the fact that he was some kind of a rebel as an individual. Now, when we talk about the city of Babel, or, um, or you, you, there, are, there is definitely the city of Babylon, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's era. But David Rawl found out through his research that there was another older city south of the city of Babylon built by Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, excavations there indicate tower structures. Excavate, the archaeological excavations uh, definitely point to tower structures, which are also called ziggurats. Uh, they are called ziggurats, which are in existence at that particular point in time. Let me just go back to my screen and see uh, what do I have there. Okay, let me just see. Um, okay, here is a here is a picture of a ziggurat. Uh, you know, when it talks about the Tower of Babel, it's uh, probably actually a reference to the ziggurat, as you can see on the screen, right? Uh, now a ziggurat, or uh, let me just also put the other picture. The other picture, according to artists, is also something like this, you know, a tower-like structure. But it is probably more like this, which is a ziggurat. And what is a ziggurat? And let me just, come back and see you all. <laughs> all right. A ziggurat is a tower-like structure, like you see in the picture, which is beside a temple or a sacred space or houses a sacred space or houses a temple. So what is the significance of building ziggurats? And according to Mesopotamian and Sumerian, uh, you know, sort of a religious culture then, these were built to invite gods to come down and inhabit the sacred space, right? Uh, they were not built for man to ascend into heaven, which is the wrong conclusion lots of people make. These were built so that the gods in residing in the heavens could come down and occupied sacred space. And when we do the theology part, you will see something very interesting there. So uh, let me just, uh, just mention that uh, the Tower of Babel was more like a ziggurat, which was built in a, in, a, in a manner, in a way where they would invite the gods to come and dwell among man, okay? Or the sacred space, all right? And David Rawl in his... Uh, uh, in his, uh, you know, historical research, 
is convinced that a tower as mentioned in the Bible existed. Now we, uh, he, he points to some locations. I won't take the time to go into all of that, uh, but uh, at least we can say that there was some veracity to what the scriptures are telling. All right, so I'm gonna leave that historicity there because there is so much we can read on that. So I'll just, I'll just mention that yes, there was uh, something like uh, the, you know, the Tower of Babel in those times. Now, let's move to the problems, all right? And uh, one of the main problem is a contradiction that people find in the narrative in Genesis chapter 11. What is this contradiction? For that, let me go back to my screen and uh, I will put some scriptures on the screen so that you will recognize what is the contradiction. Okay, so these are the pictures I showed you. Apparent contradiction between Genesis chapter 10 and 11. Now notice, we are quoting from 10. Notice it says in verse five, from these, the people of the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. All right, so notice, according to his language. I want you to notice that. Let's look at another scripture in the same chapter. This is verse 20. These are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands and by their nations. Okay, this is verse 20. Now, notice verse, uh, notice chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse one. Now the whole earth had one language, and the same words. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. All right, let me just uh, get you to participate. What do you think is the, con is the contradiction there? Do you see a very clear contradiction? Yes, the language is. <clears throat> okay, right. In yeah, Yes. In Genesis chapter 10, it talks about languages. And then Genesis 11 immediately says the world was in one language. In other words, people say the Bible is wrong because it is confused. Uh, how can there be languages in Genesis chapter 10, multiple languages, and only one language spoken of in Genesis chapter 11? That is the contradiction that the main contradiction of this Tower of Babel story, right? There are other contradictions and they are very silly. I think they are the very imbecilic and uh, uh, you, know, uh, you can just very clearly you know, brush them off. I'm going to deal with the main contradiction of Genesis 10 and 11. Okay, for that, let me again refer to, uh, I'll go back to the screen and share this with you. Uh, so you see the, lang the, the contradiction in 10 and 11. In this regard, I'm going to refer to uh, Kenneth Matthew, uh, who wrote this new American com commentary. And he has um, sorted out this particular so-called contradiction. Notice uh, what he says. He says, Genesis 10 is a geneal genealogical record while Genesis 11 is a historical narrative, all right? So you right away see there is a difference in Genesis 10 and Genesis 11 in the way the stories are being captured. Uh, Ma uh, Ma uh, Kenneth Matthew goes on to say, the different literary forms of these two chapters of Genesis 10 and Genesis 11 should be understood as complementary yet presenting information in different ways. So what he's trying to say is when somebody writes a genealogical record, you mention certain things which may not be mentioned later. But while you do a historical narrative, it becomes so much more detailed. A geneal genealogical record is, is uh, uh, you know, much more comprehensive while a historical narrative is much, much more detailed, okay? 
uh, and there is uh, just one more thought I'd like to share with you with regards to what Kenneth Matthew says. He also says, one should see Genesis 10, which is often called table of nations as a genealogical summary of the nations. Meanwhile, the narrative in Genesis 11 of the Tower of Babel provides the historical narrative, how the nations arose historically. All right. So let me stop there for a moment. Uh, so I hope you recognize what uh, uh, the so-called, you know, uh, contradiction is not really a contradiction because Genesis 10 is capturing information which is a summarization, which is a summary of what happens, uh, you know, even past Genesis 11. But Genesis 11 is the beginning of that particular summarization. And that is where people have misunderstood and to think that this is a contradiction. And that's the reason why one must <laughs> read the Bible carefully and, of course, uh, do a study of it. You know, just to uh, just to hammer the point home, suppose, you know, I say, you know, I'm just contrasting two scenarios. The first scenario is, I will say, we had a leadership meet from April 17th or April 15th to 17th, all right? So I talk about a leadership meet between April 15th to 17th. My second statement is, we had ordinations, upper men's two on Easter day. Now, do you see an apparent contradiction there? I mentioned something in you know, my first statement, which is not contained in the second statement. This is not a contradiction. First is only giving an overview of what happened from 15th to the 17th, but the second statement captures some details of what, I, what we accomplished on Easter day, which is 17th of April. I'm talking about what happened uh, in April of this past, uh, of this year, right? Okay, so uh, this, is, this is a contradiction, which is not necessarily a contradiction. It is the way you read it. And I felt that it is necessary for us to recognize that this so-called contradiction is something that is not uh, necessarily, uh, or, ne or necessarily disproves the Bible. And unfortunately, some people have ran with it thinking that, oh, the Bible is uh, full of contradictions, which is not right. Okay, I'm going to leave that there once again. If you should have any thoughts or questions or comments, we can bring them up, bring them up later. I'm going to now move, I'm sure, which is something more interesting for, for all of us, and that is the theology. What is, what is it that we can learn from this whole narrative? All right. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, why did God confuse the languages? Uh, why did God disperse the people? And once again here, I will refer to Professor John Walton, who is a professor of, Old Test of the Old Testament. And, uh, uh, and he has some interesting thought through his study of the, especially the Mesopotamian Sumerian cultures at that time he has something very interesting to share with us. Let me see if I can go back to my screen and see if there is something that I can share with you, maybe some scriptures. Okay. Uh, no, uh, this I'll come to later. All right, let me, I'm, I'm going to read to you some scriptures and I hope uh, 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 you can follow along. All right. So the question is, what is it? that made God to confuse the languages and disperse the people, all right? Uh, for that, let me just read to you some sections from the narrative. Here uh, it says, come, this is the, the, the people who are congregating. They say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. You remember I said people built these towers or ziggurats, which, which is the more technical word for it. And, and they did it to invite the gods of heaven to come and occupy 
sacred space or a, or a a temple you know either in the ziggurat itself or on the side of it all right now uh, this is a concept that existed in mesopotamia and this is how people related with their gods they believed that the gods um, you know resided in the heavens when they looked up they saw the sun and the moon and the stars and they thought they were gods and that they would build this tower so that the gods the sun god and the moon gods and the other star gods would you know uh, come down through these ziggurats that have been made right once again let me reiterate the ziggurats these towers were not for man to ascend into heaven it was to invite the gods to come descend into the earth and dwell with them all right so the ziggurats were like a stairway or a gateway for gods to inhabit the earth and dwell with man it was a way to gain uh, access to god you see people were longing to have access to god uh, especially over the fact that they had lost that access uh, going back to the garden of eden you know when mankind had access to god so um, you know i mean they're talking about the story of adam and eve and we don't know exactly how long that the garden existed but maybe that story percolated and they wanted such access to god god came in the cool of the day and fellowship with mankind i mean adam and eve at that particular point in time probably abel and cain was also alive and uh, maybe uh, i don't know i mean we, we we can only speculate all right so man wanted access to god and in their in their corrupted state of mind they thought they could invite these gods to building these ziggurats now why did they do that once again according to mesopotamian sumerian perspectives god had these gods who resided in the heavens had needs what were the needs they had need of food they had need of wine they need, had need of clothing they even had need of sexual you know to fulfill sexual desires and that is one of the reasons why you have temple prostitutes the whole concept began from there because they believed that these gods had such needs they were anthropomorphizing man you know god into man you know they're using that particular term they're wanting gods to be like man and so they decided that they will keep such things in the sacred space in the temple they will keep food and wine uh, they will bring animal sacrifices they will and even had temple prostitutes thinking that the gods would god's needs and desires would be fulfilled right and why would they do that in turn the gods would be pleased or appeased and uh, they would bless these people it would result in protection it will result in prosperity it will result in health good harvests and uh, and and well being in general so you can see that the prosperity gospel did not come just now the prosperity gospel existed even from the time of mesopotamia where people were trying to manipulate god to bless them with prosperity and health and good offspring and good harvest and all all of those all of those things even at that time you see and they believed that god the gods created humans so that these humans would fulfill the desires of these gods and so that is the reason why these ziggurats were built by these people right and notice it says come let us build ourselves a city where they congregated in one place and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves what is the meaning of that let us make a name for ourselves all right in other words they wanted to be blessed by these gods and they would they decided they will manipulate these gods into blessing them so that they could live in luxury they could 
live in so much luxury that they could be exalted, especially the priestly class would exalt themselves. If you remember in the times of Jesus, the Pharisees were wealthy people and they believed that they were blessed by God. And they had exalted themselves over the people. They were making a name for themselves through their so-called devotion to God. And this is the same kind of attitude that existed even in Mesopotamia, not realizing that the Pharisees, even the Jewish people, imbibed of these kinds of attitudes and concepts and brought them into their own religious practices and experiences. <laughs> so they they wanted <coughs> pardon me they wanted the gods to live among them so that they can control these gods for their benefits manipulate these gods so that they can have power and prestige independent of gods once the gods are appeased or pleased the gods will not bother them so independent of these gods they would have all of the power that is the meaning of they wanted to make a name for themselves, right? In other words, they wanted to be like gods, right? They didn't, they were not God, but they wanted to be like gods so that they could exalt themselves and have a name for themselves. Does that ring a bell? To be like gods? It goes back to the temptation in the Garden of Eden, isn't it? So you begin to see the rebellion against God did not stop with the Garden of Eden. It continued during the times of Noah and the flood had to come. And even after that, the rebellion of man against God continued because they did not recognize and understand, you know, who the true God was. Okay. And what happened then? Verse 5 in Genesis 11 says, And the Lord came down to see the city, and the tower which the children of man had built. Now, here, once again, some people will, you know, try to find or try to poke holes in the biblical narrative. They will say, what is the need for God to come down to see the tower? Is it that the God cannot see the tower from, from the heavens? Isn't he not omnipresent and omnipotent? Well, once again, that's a very simplistic reading of the scriptures. And perhaps I should say a literalistic reading, which can lead to errors. The, the way it is written is actually a literary expression to signify that God coming down is to basically show that the thing is so puny. What, the, what mankind built at that time is so small, so puny that it doesn't threaten God in any way, you see? And so the expression is, God came down to show human beings, you know, you are basically, you think you built a great tower, but it's nothing, it's absolutely nothing. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the, it's the uh, you can use the word irony, you know, irony. Irony means an expression using language that normally signifies the opposite, right? You're using language to signify the opposite. So it is not that God couldn't see the tower. He came to show mankind that the tower is so puny. What are you trying to threaten me with it for? You know? So it's a typically a humorous or an it is for humorous or emphatic effect. Okay, so that is uh, what it says in verse five. Let's go to verse six. Verse six says, and the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. What does that mean? You see, what God is referring to here is that they are one people. They congregated together and started living in the city state, building this tower, thinking that they can manipulate God. And with that one language, they were able to you know, uh, accomplish uh, a fair bit in terms of the building projects and all of that. And it says, this is only the beginning of what they will do and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. The reference there is not that 
they can literally go to heaven and meet up with God. No, that is not the reference. What the scriptures indicate is that their sinfulness, the corruption of their minds will have no limits. Once they begin to think like this, that they can manipulate God, that corruption of that mind will have no limits and they will go from worse to worse, worse corruption to worse corruption. Their minds will be so completely polluted that the image that they were built in will be marred beyond limits, you know, and God never intended mankind to live in that state. They will become more and more and more, you know, you could say beastly rather than human. And so God did not intend for human beings to descend into such corruption. So when it says nothing they propose to do will be impossible for them, it is a reference to they will become so corrupt that they, you know, will just, uh, they'll just get, keep getting worse. They will not stop at anything that is even worse than that, right? It has nothing to do with trying to overtake heaven, right? So that is what it means uh, uh, when it talks about uh, nothing is impossible for them. Okay, let's now then um, slowly wrap up. I'll just read you two more verses and uh, we can stop. Verse seven in Genesis 11 says, come, this is continuing the narrative, come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Why would God do that? Because their potential for total corruption would now be frustrated. By doing this, their potential for uh, a worse kind of corruption will be frustrated by the confusion of the language. And, uh, and then, of course, distributing them throughout the land. God's plan was to restore humanity. And this would begin through Abraham. This, of course, comes after Genesis, after these particular incidences are over. God's plan was to restore human beings, but human beings were going in the direction of total non-restoration. They were going into total corruption. And eventually, God had to stop that and then begin his plan of restoration through Abraham and, of course, down through Abraham, through Israel and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 8 in Genesis 11 says, So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Verse 9, therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. This is where the distribution of the nations take place. And this is what is referred to in Genesis chapter 10. You know, the uh, descendants of Ham and Cush and Japheth. This is what Genesis 10 was actually referring to. Some actually feel that this is also referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Let me just quickly uh, make a reference to that. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, Notice it says in verse 7, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. Now there is some there is some controversy here in verse eight, the later part, it says, according to the number of the sons of God, uh, some people say sons of Israel. Uh, it is actually the original Hebrews, Elohim, sons of Elohim. Uh, but the Lord's portion, verse nine, is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Now, I will not get into that. That's another Bible study by itself. Um, but all I can say is God decided to work through a nation. Notice his allotted inheritance was one nation. All the other nations will be controlled by the sons of Elohim. What are those? 
That is the divine counsel mentioned in Psalm chapter 82. Once again, I'm just throwing some references, uh, which will, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, is something interesting. Uh, a theologian called Michael Heiser uh, elaborates on this. And so if some of you want to get into his theology, which of course is extremely <laughs> scholarly, uh, you can do that. But this is where the, the distribution of the nations takes place. All right. Now, let me go ahead and stop there. I wanted to bring back one particular thought, which I will probably do towards the end, but let me give you a chance now to respond. So the floor is open. If you have any questions or comments, uh, go ahead. I hope I was uh, able to do justice <laughs> to uh, the passage and let me see what you have you know, in mind for me. I think Mr. Rao has a question right away. So I'll go ahead. This was uh, Mr. Rao's original question, which we are doing a study on. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, Mr. Rao. Go ahead. Actually, there is a communication gap be between the man who told me about this. Uh, I think what he told me was wrong according to the Bible. I have not studied after that. Right. What he said was God destroyed the uh, the, the Babel Tower of Babel okay. because uh, people want to reach heaven, reach God and God has destroyed it to avoid reaching him. Okay. But I think that is not written in the Bible. Yes. So right. That was the actually uh, problem. So okay. I wanted you to clarify that. Oh, okay. yes. And looks like your phone is ringing. So you can. Uh, yeah, some... I think somebody's there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, uh, you said that this particular person said that God destroyed the tower, which is also not correct. <laughs> okay. The Bible does not say God destroyed the tower. He only confused the languages, dispersed them, and they stopped building the tower. Yeah. And like you rightly said, the Bible does not say that the, the tower was built so that they can all go to heaven and live forever with God. No, that was not uh, what the Bible says. So they are completely misreading it. And that is the unfortunate thing. Lots of people misread yeah. it and then find, uh, you know, controversies. Yeah. Okay. But I hope that uh, if you had any questions, you could have, uh, I mean, I hope I clarified that. But if you have any more, please go ahead. Yes, Surimurthy, go ahead. You mentioned a song. What was it in the song? You mentioned one song. What is mentioned in this song? Okay, that's a, that's a totally different subject, Surya Murthy. That is Psalm 82, where it talks about the divine counsel and the sons of God, or the sons of Elohim, uh, which is, which the nations that were uh, dispersed were given to these sons of Elohim to rule, to be judges. That is what Psalm 82 says. Now, <laughs> once again, this is controversial and uh, uh, it is, you really need to get into the scriptures to study that. Well, we can do that another time, but that has nothing to do with the Tower of Babel. <laughs> Mr. Ra Mr. Rao was telling about the destruction of the Tower. During the Iraqi war, when the U.S. invaded Iraq, Saddam Hussein parked dummy airplanes near the cigarettes. He wanted that the Americans should destroy the cigarette so that the world will rise against USA. But uh, they didn't. USA didn't fall into the trap. <laughs> they did not destroy the cigarette. Okay. Right. Yes, uh, the modern, the, 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 the city of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar was supposed to be in Iraq, 
but the old city of Babel was probably south of it, according to David Rohr, once again, uh, that is part of uh, historical research. Right. Any, uh, any other, uh, sorry, if I stopped you, Surimurti, you were going to say something else? No, 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 I have finished. Okay. Okay, I have a question. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> I've also heard it say that uh, God actually confused the language and scattered them at the Tower of Babel so that not only their wickedness, but their material progress would not be so rapid. In other words, you know, <clears throat> if God had a thousand year plan in mind, they would have reached that in 500 years or 600 years. And so he confused it so that, you know, the man takes longer to uh, reach that kind of state. I don't know what mm -hmm. truth is there in that. Once again, I would say that these are speculations. Uh, obviously, we don't have, you know, records to prove it. But um, we do know from the, the entire council of the scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament, what is God's intention? So what we can do is make some educated guesses. God's intention was to bring man into fellowship with human, you know, uh, with, with him, with himself, father, son, spirit. And so if this corruption of mankind was beginning to be so rapid, maybe there is some thought or maybe there is some veracity to the fact that God stopped that progress, you know, stopped that progress so that they won't become, along with material, uh, what do you call it, uh, progress, maybe... Uh, uh, spiritual and moral degradation would not be so rapid, perhaps, where they could actually destroy themselves, completely destroy themselves. And God was never intended to destroy <clears throat> beings. Yes, makes sense. Right. <clears throat> Surya Murthy, go ahead. Regarding the origin of the languages, Science has no answer. How did the languages originate? Okay. The best possible explanation is what is mentioned in the Bible. There is no other explanation. Yes, once again, controversy there. I mean, there are, there are linguistic experts who believe that there were many languages even before uh, the Tower of Babel. Uh, but the general belief is since human beings descended from a common ancestor, they obviously could have been one language to begin with, you know, and some people call it the Adamic language, you know, the language that was spoken by Adam and Eve continued till, of course, to the time it came to Noah and the sons and the descendants where the languages were uh, uh, confused. But the origin of languages, uh, once again, we are only have a 6,000 year history of this. Uh, we do not have any history beyond that, even though some civilizations, you know, like to boast that they are beyond 6,000 years. They talk about 8,000 years and 10,000 years. But, uh, <laughs> but the recorded history shows that languages are only about 6,000 years old. I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong, please, uh, you know, give me some thoughts on that. Uh, the re I mean, some of these experts say that uh, the oldest language was the Akkadian language. Okay. And actually, the oldest language in India, Tamil, is, is connected with that. So the oldest language in the world is actually Akkadian and Tamil. That's what the experts uh, say. Rika, you, you've yeah. done some research. Yeah, archaeologists have shown that uh, pre-flood, uh, some old uh, tablets have been found in which they mentioned the flood and, and the, the, the flood theory is all over the world. Everyone has a theory on the flood. So this really does go back to the old, <laughs> old uh, thing that there was a, a, a universal flood and people did record, record, it. record it. And they also see that uh, proving the language and linguistics that uh, in the, uh, there was this uh, king, uh, a Syrian king, uh, who, who has these tablets that are in four tablets which are written in Akkadian 
and they have tried to prove that the oldest language was Akkadian that they know of. And, uh, it's, and there are a person called Clyde Winters who's written a book on how the relationship between Akkadian and the Tamil is, is there. So if you study that in detail, it, uh, it does explain that. Very interesting. You will have a lot of rivals here <laughs> <laughs> when you say that Tamil is the oldest. Uh, there are lots of people trying to disprove that. And you know, some other language they would like to promote. I will not uh, go into that. But you know, even the Chinese language they say is also a very ancient origin. I don't know how far that is true, but, uh, but yes, uh, yeah, there is a lot of, uh, you know, ambiguity there. Any other thoughts uh, or comments? Any questions? If not, let me just finish. Um, let me see. Om Prakash, did you have a question? I'm not sure. Okay. Thanks, sir. Okay, I thought you had a question. Uh, let me just finish with one, one uh, concluding thought, and then we can uh, take one or two more comments. You know, we were just looking at this whole Mesopotamian Sumerian perspective where they wanted the gods to come and dwell with them so that they would uh, be able to manipulate these gods and fulfill their desires so that the human beings can exalt themselves and become like gods and have a name for themselves. But did you, but you know, from our, from our, uh, biblical Trinitarian perspective, what is God's desire? God's desire is actually to dwell with humankind, you know, to fellowship with humankind. And he proved that and showed that in the Garden of Eden. You see? But the way human beings went about it is not that they wanted God to be exalted. They went about it to want to exalt themselves. And that is the big sin. That is the rebellion that has taken place between man, I mean, man against God. And tempted by the serpent, and we know there is a serpent uh, or a, a representative serpent, which is representative of a cosmic evil that is opposed to God's plan and wants to destroy humanity so that God would not have that kind of dwelling and fellowship with human beings. But we do know that God desires to dwell with humans. But what we understand from our Trinitarian perspective is that man should be in harmony with God, not in opposition, not in competition, not in manipulation. But in harmony, because human beings cannot challenge God. Human beings are created of the created order. And the angelic hosts are also of the created order. They cannot challenge God. God is sovereign. There is no duality that we believe in that good and evil are of the same, are of the same force or the same power. No, God is omnipotent and there is nothing that can challenge him. And interestingly enough, we know from the scriptures that God will one will finally dwell with human beings. You remember what Jesus said? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Interesting, isn't it? We human beings are trying to prepare a place for God to dwell in and to domesticate God, <laughs> to keep God as a parrot in a cage. But Jesus said, no, I am going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you will be, right? And that is where God decided to start with Abraham and going on with, uh, you know, the Israel, the nation, God dwells in the tent with Israel, remember? So God is showing that he's interested to dwell with human beings. That's his ultimate plan, but not as a domesticated God, but as a God who is our father and we are his children. All right. And that was accomplished in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And of course, ultimately, in the end, that plan will be accomplished and the evil one will not succeed. 
to thwart that plan. I just wanted to leave you with that thought from this whole concept of the Tower of Babel. Any, any thoughts or any, any final comments? When will that happen? <laughs> Soon. <laughs> I mean, did, did, did not Jesus say, I, I, I am coming soon or something? <laughs> yes. So all I, can say is, soon. <laughs> all I can say is Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> Achen, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think you nailed it. Uh, the domesticated God, the, what they were doing. And how it opposed to what God wanted to. I think that's a clear co contrast because we have seen throughout and throughout the Old Testament the presence of God with his people, leading them, guiding them. And uh, as opposed to here. So I think that's that's the main takeaway for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, since you mentioned that such and look at all the religions of the world, you know, it's exactly the opposite, isn't it? Uh, gods that are domesticated. But uh, in the Christian perspective, it is so very different. And God is a father to us, right? So uh, we, we cannot manipulate him and control him or force him into anything. His plan will stand. Thanks for mentioning that, Sachin. Well, if there are no other thoughts from our um, theologians, Praveen and... Uh, our uh, our uh, apologist Franklin Poppins. Any thoughts? Historicity. Uh, we can close. Otherwise, I don't know. I can see Franklin there, but I'm not sure he's active. Franklin, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. Very much, sir. Very much present. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Any thoughts, Franklin? Uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, only one small uh, humble suggestion, sir. Yeah. Is it possible to announce a subject one month in advance sir? <laughs> so that, sir, lazy people like me will have ample time to do some spade work and uh, uh, come, come okay. prepared. <laughs> well, I mean, you have a month from now <laughs> to do your research on this. And maybe if you have some new findings, you can present it later on, Franklin. So you're welcome to do that. Okay. 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 Right. All right, then, thank you so much for joining and some thoughts uh, which you brought out, which is good. And Franklin, since you're online now, can you lead us in a closing prayer, thanking God for his grace and mercy? Gracious Lord, our loving Father in heaven, thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to meet together and then to study a new subject afresh. Lord, very rarely we take up such subjects uh, I understand, Lord, that the information is sketchy and uh, still we need to have reliable documentation from theologians. Lord, we pray that you will be with us and help us. Lord, open our un understanding, Lord, to what you have to say, the real intention. Thank you, Father, today's message. Thank you, Lord. I understand that the people of Babylon who were constructing the tower had mollified intentions and you had to step in and stop it. Thank you, Lord. And on the flip side, it is your express desire, Lord, to give us all the good things to come and to dwell with us. Thank you, Lord, for this great hope and joy you have given us. Lord, we ask your blessings upon us that you will help us to learn and grow in your grace at all times. Be with our pastor, Dan, Sachin and Praveen and all, our, all of us, Father, so that we can actively participate and contribute. Thank you, Father. We ask your blessings upon us as we close today's session. In Jesus' precious name, we ask all this. Amen. 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 And thank you all again. Have a good rest of the day. God bless you all. Amen.